just getting myself sorted with the recording one second might announce to us that the recording's begun no it didn't but i think we're all going so thank you for being so punctual we're going to get started straight away because i can see from the guest list that i've got everybody here who i'm supposed to have today uh, welcome to today's jim morgan foundation talk on the symbolism of fruit and vegetables in painting um throughout uh, sort of the western tradition of art history from um sort of the uh, antiquity right up to modern art so i hope there's a little bit of something tasty in this for everybody I'll be delivering the talk and managing the slides today. So if you do have any questions, put them in the chat box, which I'll be able to check regularly. Um, but I won't keep an eye on it uh, all the way through the talk because it is quite distracting um, when you start reading questions uh, as well as trying to present. If someone could just give me a quick uh, yes that everything's working and you can hear me okay, that's always really helpful. Into the chat box, that is, of course. Thank you very much. I'm going to get started. Excuse the dog. I hope nobody minds. <laughs> the dog in here as well today. I think it'll stop in a second. Um, so the first image that we're looking at here is uh, an image of a mosaic floor. And this is just to really give you the idea that fruit and vegetables have been depicted in artworks since antiquity. So this exact mosaic floor is from the Emperor Hadrian's villa at Tivoli, um, which you can see here has been uh, absolutely littered with different um, sort of parts of fruit and vegetables that we can imagine probably sort of left over from a banquet that would have been held in this hall. And this is exactly the idea that uh, this upper class or sort of ruling class um, Roman would have wanted people to think upon entering his house. The style that the, um, the, the fruit and veg and, and other things so you can see fish bones in there and oyster shells and, and uh, the skins and kernels of nuts uh, and the idea behind that is that look, the range of food that's on offer and the fact that so much of this has been discarded, it suggests a human presence in the room prior to the, the one that we're looking at um, in the mosaic floor. And so we conjure up all sorts of images of grandeur, of feasting and of parties. And that is a particular uh, sort of uh, idea that um, would have been of interest to the Roman emperor. And that's why these food items have been um, executed with absolute realism and accuracy uh, during the process of putting these mosaics together. So a really clever um, flaw there, the, the idea of having the fruit and veg um, depicted in that sort of state of uh, being, being within a banquet in the cooking is absolutely to hint to the human presence behind that. Um, this is one of the best preserved examples of these trompe l'oeil or trick of the eye flaws, which were intended to look uh, real, that were depicted in mosaic. Um, and it's actually uh, uh, was preserved at Pompeii, um, which is why it's so beautiful. And the colors are preserved so well today, of course, when Mount Vesuvius erupted, um, that volcanic lava set over much of the town of, uh, of Pompeii um, in Italy and preserved everything that was left underneath it, including, which I quite like the sort of uh, symbolism between uh, this idea and the floor itself, uh, including people who were dining and having these banquets, you know, were uh, sadly and horrifically killed um, by the lava explosion, only to be uh, discovered um, uh, by archaeologists hundreds of years later. So this idea of uh, a banquet just left, which is depicted so beautifully in the marble floor, then has these quite sinister connotations um, of uh, the sort of realism of the banquets that would have been held in Pompeii at that time. It's needless to say that this is a floor from a luxury villa, a luxury building. Uh, not everybody could afford to have this painstaking mosaic in such um, detailed realism across their floor. It's the work of a fine artist and craftsman who has put that down. So something uh, a little bit different and that we, you know, clearly fast forward, uh, not just 
um, centuries, but millennia with this picture. But again, we have uh, this um, uh, fruit symbolism um, in the picture, uh, which is, is quite a, a, a consistent symbol throughout uh, the, the canon of, of Western Old Master picture. Um, and although the fruit symbolism has its roots in classical literature, and as we'll see, often symbolize the activities of gods, goddesses and religion. There are other fruits and vegetables which were taken sort of from that idea of them sort of being as key symbols um, for uh, gods and goddesses, but would be uh, in, in, interpreted into more secular uh, pieces of artwork because that symbolism was so ingrained in the people of the Middle Ages and through the Renaissance. And they sort of lent on that same symbolism to negotiate ideas. And here we see the pomegranate in um, this Cornelius de Vos painting of uh, a portrait of a family. So whilst this very wealthy family um, of guilders uh, in, uh, in the Netherlands in the 1600s um, are there to, you know, having a sitting for a family portrait, again, a very wealthy family, really what's at the heart of this picture, almost in the dead center of it, is a child holding a pomegranate. And the pomegranate was a traditional symbol for fertility. And although it's a picture uh, which depicts this realistic family um, in this sort of very contemporary dress in this contemporary setting, and that's the idea behind it, the symbolism of the pomegranate actually comes from Greek mythology uh, and was depicted in mythological paintings as an attribute of Venus and a symbol of desire. And the fertility um, became because of its many seeds. So if you've ever opened and peeled a pomegranate, you'll know that there are hundreds of these tiny little um, uh, delicious seeds uh, within it. Uh, and the, um, the, the idea uh, behind, behind that uh, comes from mythology. Uh, supposedly the pomegranate grew out of the blood streaming from the wounded genitals of a lustful asceticis, um, and, and uh, a god uh, who was castrated um, and his penis was thrown into the sea. So a, a bit of a gruesome one there for lunch time, I'm afraid. But it was apparent, uh, apparently a nymph uh, ate his um, dismembered genitals uh, and as the pomegranate and became pregnant as a result. And so we have the pomegranate standing in, in this family portrait for fertility. And you can see that it's uh, clearly worked as uh, this family have far, four, four children with them at the moment, but actually went on to have nine children. And so that pomegranate um, is uh, clearly a symbol of fertility in this picture. The pomegranate uh, sort of continued to be a key fit feature of paintings um, and is possibly best known for its fateful role in the myth of Proserpina or Persephone. And in Ovid's Metamorphoses, the classic um, text from antiquity, Proserpina is abducted by Pluto, who's the ruler of the underworld, and her mother, Ceres, or sometimes or, uh, Demeter, um, is secured for, from release from the underworld. But before leaving Hades, she grabs a pomegranate and eats it. And because she's eaten that fruit of the underworld, um, she is compelled to spend a part of every year there. And it was her uh, annual sort of return to the underworld and then to the real world, which brought about the seasons uh, as Sarah's um, was sort of linked to Mother Earth. So within that, um, that symbolism, we, uh, we have sort of both aspects really of that um, fruit being used by the pre-Raphaelite artist Dante Gabriel Rossetti in his picture of Proserpine from 1874. Um, the sort of symbolism here with the pomegranate is, is particularly well known. And it's of that temptation and that fall from grace, which of course did happen to Proserpine uh, in mythology. Um, when, when that goddess was taken into the underworld and slipped up and ate from this beautiful fruit. Also as well, um, I think we get an idea that uh, Rosetti is using it in both senses um, of the fruit, maybe not uh, in terms of fertility, but certainly in terms of, uh, sort of this lustful symbolism, um, which we know from the model being Jane Morris, the wife of Rossetti's friend, William Morris, uh, on whom I think it's fair to say Rossetti had a, a, a massive crush at the very least. 
Rossetti explained uh, the subject of his picture in a letter to W.A. Turner, who bought one version of the picture, of which many exist, many versions of this picture exist. Uh, we're actually looking at the couple that's in the Tate, um, if anybody's particularly interested in that. And in 1877, um, he wrote to W.A. Turner, the figure represents Proserpine as Empress of Hades. After she was conveyed by Pluto to his realism and became his bride, her mother Ceres importuned Jupiter for her return to Earth and he was prevailed on to consent to this, provided she only had not partaken of any of the fruits of Hades. It was found, however, that she had eaten one grain of a pomegranate and this enchained her to her new empire and destiny. She's represented in a gloomy corridor of her palace with the fateful fruit in her hand. As she passes, a gleam strikes on the wall behind her, behind her forms some inlet suddenly opened and emitting for a moment the light of the upper world. And she glances futilely towards it, immersed in thought. So the subject of this picture is actually um, uh, is suggested, as I've, I've mentioned, by the fact that the model is Jane Morris. Um, and by all accounts, you know, Jane sort of wasn't particularly happy during the period of the 1870s when this picture um, was painted, spending some of the year with Rossetti at Kelmscott Manor, the Oxfordshire retreat that Rossetti and William Morris had bought together, uh, whilst her husband was um, sort of had taken himself off to Iceland. And of course, we know that there were rumours of Rossetti and Jay Morris having an affair during that period. And I think it's quite interesting that at the same time this picture was taken, aside from all the symbolism of the pomegranate, um, the symbolism of Jane being the model herself uh, indicates this sort of shared life with Proserpina and the idea that she would spend half of her year with her husband and half of a year with her lover so we get that same sort of cyclical nature to life um which uh, by all accounts caused her quite an unhappy marriage um this uh, is the seventh version of this picture and lots of the versions actually sort of met with disaster and this picture was the second one painted for fr leyland who was a huge collector of victorian art and liverpool based shipping magnate uh, and some of the other symbols in it, such as the incense burner, is an attribute of the goddess. Um, and we also have uh, sort of that curve of the ivy, which is a symbol of the clinging memory, which is echoed in Proserpine's arm and the rich folds of the drapery. Um, there's also a poem by Rossetti on the frame, which emphasizes all of these ideas. So if Proserpina or Persephone is the daughter, uh, it's also um, sort of interesting to consider uh, Demeter or Ceres um, as Mother Earth, as the mother of Persephone. And it was her mourning for her daughter in the underworld for those six months of the year that caused the winter as she forgot to pollinate and sort of create the fruit um, of the world, which is why we get these. Uh, so what on earth she's up to at the moment with all this rainy August? Uh, I don't know, but she's to blame. Uh, and this is a painting or an imagination of her by the artist Evelyn de Morgan. And you can see here she's depicted um, Persephone in this dreadful state of distress and mourning. But if you look closely to the head that she clings onto as she aches for her daughter, you can see that the artist has plattered grains of corn into her hair. Um, so this obviously symbolizing the harvest and the end of Persephone's time on earth, um, of course being cut short as her daughter enters back into the underworld. So a beautiful sort of autumnal picture, which is quite uh, nice to enjoy at this time um, of the year. To skip back in time slightly and begin to consider another fruit, which um, has quite a strong symbolism, not just throughout art history, but throughout history itself, uh, after we've looked at the pomegranate, is that of the apple. And this has a particular resonance in um, paintings, uh, Christian faith. Um, and a lot of that comes from the fact that the Latin word for apple and evil are the same. Malum. So the apple becomes associated with the tree of knowledge from which Eve ate the forbidden fruit, causing the downfall of man. The infant Jesus is often depicted with an apple, um, and this is to signify his future role uh, as redeemer from sin and death. So he holds the apple uh, in order to sort of welcome um, the, his, his, his future role on earth and for that to be uh, depicted clearly to the audience who are looking at it. 
Um, this is a rather fantastic, I think, example of um, the Madonna and Child with the, the infant Christ uh, sort of surrounded by these apples. Um, and it's by an artist called Carlo Crivelli, uh, who was um, alive uh, sort of in the, the early part of the Italian Renaissance in the 15th century. Um, Crivelli is a, a brilliant artist, as I think this painting attests to. That stark realism that he sort of taught himself uh, to use um, using a mixture of egg tempera and oil paint so right on the cusp of a new tradition in painting which he used oils to give a, a far stronger realism to one of the pieces. Crivelli was born in Venice and probably changed with Squarciani in Padua and spent most of his life in the Italian marches which are uh, eastern central Italy um, after also spending spending periods in Venice and Zara. He was active as a painter by 1457 but around that time he was condemned to Venice for adultery and then spent most of his life working creating altarpieces in the marshes. Um, his pictures often uh, depict saints and uh, the lives of Christ but within these beautiful architectural features which reflect the architecture he would have known in real life but also with these wonderful festoons of fruit and this uh, sort of amazing vegetable so in the image that we're looking at now of Crivelli's Madonna and Child you'll see that there's also this sort of gourd hanging over um, the, the figure of the Madonna uh, and that was a symbol of salvation of a damnation um, and associated with salvation because of the story of Jonah where God caused a gourd to grow over the prophet's head as a shelter. So there we go, we've got a, a, a number of different uh, symbolic elements of fruit and veg in this wonderful picture. Because I'm a big fan of Crivelli's work, I've got two Crivelli pictures to show you. Uh, so the Madonna della Rondine, Rondine meaning swallow, which you can see uh, depicted uh, in this picture just above um, the Madonna and child. And again, I think showing you this picture, you start to appreciate that sort of rich detail that Crivelli put into these altarpieces that he was creating. This large panel does come from an altarpiece um, painted in around 1490, which was made for the Ottoni family chapel in the Fran Franciscan church at Maltelica in the Italian marshes. And it depicts the Virgin, um, to whom the chapel was dedicated, as the Queen of Heaven, with saints uh, on each side um, of her to represent the concerns of the patron. So one is a churchman and the other is a soldier. Um, we've got Saint Jerome there, the patron of scholars and theologians, and Saint Sebastian and the patron saint of soldiers so that all ties in with the kind of social history of that area um, but again we have this wonderful festoon of apples uh, pears and grapes which go around the feet of the saint and the sitter and again the gourd and the apple hanging above um, the, the central figures as well as Christ holding the apple so freeing us from our original sin in uh, Christian symbolism um, I think it's really the realism of Crivelli that's to be admired and, and perhaps the reason why so much fruit and veg entered into his pictures. Um, using that same sort of realism that we saw in the mosaic floor, the idea is in, within that that the human, humans are so familiar with fruit, you can't really get any closer to an object uh, than you do to something that you are eating. It's in your hand and you feel it and you understand the shape and the texture of the piece of fruit, how the skin feels, what it tastes like. It's a full sensory experience. And so in looking at this picture of something divine and something so far removed from our normal sort of human experience, to have that with the humble apple, I think allows a deeper engagement with this painting. And when depicting religious scenes, what Crivelli really did amongst the Renaissance painters was break away from using the quite uh, stiff, stoic, um, far more formal figures from Byzantium into making these beautiful but yet very engaging pieces. Another trick that Crivelli often uses is to allow his figures to step from their world over into ours. And we see that to marvelous effect in this picture. If you look right down at the bottom, just um, next to uh, St. Jerome's foot here, you can see his beautiful red cape just curling over the edge of um, the, the marble plinth that the figures are uh, stood on. And in doing so, 
when this painting was in its altarpiece and in its beautiful engraved frame, it really does help to blur that line between sacred and and real and to our world. And then, um, you, you know, if that uh, sort of strip at the bottom of the picture was then reflected in a, in a real frame in our world, the boundary um, is, is, it becomes closer. The fruits, something you can almost taste and smell, the cloth, something you can almost reach out to. And I definitely think that was in, um, in Crivelli's uh, mind when he was painting these pictures is to really give sort of an overbearing sense that um, religion is within the grasp of the ordinary person. A fantastic uh, artist. And those, uh, this second picture here is on display at the National Gallery in London. If anyone wants to sort of go and have that deeper interaction with the, with the painting. When this uh, picture was acquired by the National Gallery in 1862, it was revered by artists of the day uh, who flocked to see it and would uh, really be engaged in that, um, that deep realism, which of course, I think this audi audience knows quite well from um, pre-Raphaelitism. And one artist who certainly would have seen the work of Carlo Crivelli in her copying of paintings from the National Gallery throughout the 1870s um, was a, a young Evelyn de Morgan. So although this picture is much later than the acquisition of the Crivelli by the gallery painted in 1905, I think we can start to see some of the same tricks being used by this artist that Crivelli did. And within that, I mean the symbolism of the fruit and vegetables. Cadence of autumn, uh, you can see uh, the a cadence in music means um, a piece of music which rises to a crescendo, a quite grand finish. And that's exactly what's happening in this picture as we look through the figures of the women from spring through to wind, uh, winter. But rather than that being a cycle, Morgan's presenting it as um, a, a, a rise, as something that's being celebrated, something grand that we're working towards, even though we often think of winter as death, she sees that as a period of rebirth. And this links to her ideas about spirituality and the continuation of the human soul after the death of the body, represented, of course, by winter. But we see that spring will come again, um, even though she sees uh, winter as the sort of glorious ending to the soul that is this beautiful picture. However, for the same reasons as Crivelli, um, I think we have sort of this wonderful harvest collected by the figures of uh, sort of summer and early autumn in this picture. As the women work together to fill this basket, it's something that's been labored over by them. It's not, certainly doesn't look to me like a very effective way of filling that net with the fruit that's sort of scattered around them. It's this idea of, of plenty, um, but also that the figures are engaged in this almost sort of poetic, dance as well around the fruit and vegetables. Uh, it, it certainly adds that dynamism to the picture, which helps to pick up on um, the, the idea and the symbolism behind it as a whole. But just like with the Crivelli picture, you feel like you can almost reach into this painting and pick up uh, a piece of fruit that we're so familiar with. Everything here from gourds, to apples, to pomegranates themselves. So uh, a real bounty that's ripe, not just with all these impossible different fruits, but with that symbolism that we've seen those fruits representing. Evelyn de Morgan's uncle uh, was the artist John Rodham Spencer Stanhope, and he also engaged um, in many, illustrating many biblical texts through his painting. And I really think his Eve Tempted speaks to the idea of the apple as the forbidden fruit or the original sin. Remember those Latin words were the same for uh, apple and evil. And I've never really seen a character that represents or embodies evil so much as this horrific snake-like creature whispering into Eve's ear in Spencer Stanhope's Eve Tempted. He uses not just the fruit, but also this floral imagery to depict uh, the Garden of Eden, this beautiful, bountiful garden. And of course, uh, as we know uh, from the, the, the biblical story of Adam and Eve, we see the serpent whispering into Eve's ear to take a bite from the tree of knowledge. And of course, um, this uh, leads to Adam and Eve's later expulsion from the Garden of Eden to become humankind. Uh, but that was, again, rich detail behind Behind this beautiful picture um, uh, sort of really helps to uh, engage us with, um, with the, the story that's going on. And that picture is in the collection of Manchester Art Gallery. 
So a picture that um, slices if you will, through the two that we've just look at, looked at in terms of time, is uh, Suzanne's basket of apples. And I wanted to show you this um, so that we can think about the sort of the ordinary meaning of um, fruit and vegetables in pictures. So often they are imbued with this symbolism, but actually in, uh, in this artwork, um, we see an artist using the humble apple or the humble still life for quite different reasons. Paul Cézanne is a French artist um, and was part of the, it's largely associated with post-impressionism and he's a painter whose work laid the foundations uh, from a sort of a real shift in our work from depicting the real and depicting moralizing subjects through to using art to be explorative of the medium itself so his artwork really um, uh, sort of bridged that gap between impressionism which did catch at least an impression of the modern world through to cubism which was very much uh, an interpretation of how people see and engage with the world around them. And what Suzanne does so brilliantly in this picture is really challenge the idea of a linear perspective. Whereas artists from Renaissance painting through to his own time had used a single point of perspective in their pictures, so a single point to which everything would, uh, would disappear, much how um, human vision works. He's actually talking here about the whole human experience of, um, of fruit and vegetables and food and eating by tilting the table right up towards us and also showing us the entire still life at once. So it's really that vantage point which sets this artwork apart from some of the others that we've seen. It can feel quite unbalanced. The incline of the basket puts us on edge, um, much as we might do if we were walking around a piece which was so bountiful. Um, of, of all the apples that are depicted here. You can just imagine one rolling off the table onto the floor and you can even almost hear that dull thud of a ripe apple. Um, and again, you, you sort of start to feel the sense of the, the, the colours of light and the refraction of light within this southern French setting uh, of where the picture was painted. Um, the white tablecloth isn't white and that's another play on our visual senses to give us an overall uh, bodily experience. Um, so the fact it's an apple is really uh, quite secondary to our experience of it at all as a human, which is actually what this clever artist is depicting in uh, what I think is a beautiful study uh, of colour and light above all else. Still life painting, of course, has uh, often focused on fruit and vegetables. The great advantage of that is that these things don't move around. So for an artist such as Joris van Som and other Dutch masters of um, still life painting in around the 17th century um, in the Netherlands, uh, where this sort of type or style of painting really took off. Uh, the fact that these objects sort of don't move around as, as people do really allowed the artist to have a deeper um, uh, expression of the realism of um, the fruit and vegetables. Um, so often this uh, type of Dutch still life painting has exquisite realism and detail and it was enormous popular, enormously popular amongst the wealthy clientele who would buy this sort of painting. So a lot like we saw, it was the wealthy patron who had the mosaic floor uh, in, um, in, in the first slide. We see here that same idea that it's this picture is made for someone wealthy who wasn't just wealthy enough to collect the beautiful lemons and lobsters from across the globe but wealthy enough to have those immortalized in paint a, sub, a medium usually reserved for religion and for nobility and for portrait painting so in pink uh, depicting a still life of uh, the fruits and vegetables that your family could afford. It was a real sign to anyone entering your merchant house um, and your new sort of modern home, uh, particularly in, in Amsterdam, but also in cities like Antwerp and Ghent, uh, huge trading centres in the 17th century. Um, that uh, you, you had the means about you to do that. They're trophies of the, the sophisticated and they have been um, depicted in a picture which they can then hang on the wall behind and around the, um, the pictures themselves. There's a real luxury uh, here which reflects the kind of gluttony of that, um, of that class. 
but the images aren't a snapshot of a realistic banquet. They are symbols of status and power. So even though we've lost some of maybe the traditional symbolism of the fruit and veg, it takes on a new meaning with lemons that have been transported across the world to that trading center um, uh, of the Netherlands in the 17th century. Um, so it's quite a sort of subtle meaning um, which the pictures take on. They're not supposed to be a realistic image of something you'd sit down to eat, but rather something impossible and luxurious uh, that uh, can really only be captured by having that extra layer of wealth that allows you to have this picture painted. Um, the lemon uh, also can symbolize love and longevity. So the idea that this wealth is ongoing, but also the bittersweet um, irony of life. Uh, and this, uh, these, uh, patrons and artists working in um, the, the Dutch 17th century were quite interested in uh, Banitas pictures as well, which might have something like an extinguished candle or a skull on a table, um, also painted as still life to really emphasize the idea that, uh, you know, we are mortal and death is not too far away. So with the bittersweet lemon, I think that hints at the, uh, the nature of wealth is that it isn't actually something as permanent as the painting um, itself could be. It's quite a, an interesting aspect to have that beautiful curled skin of lemon. Um, during this period as well, uh, paints had really developed and using oil paint on canvas had become a medium in which artists were working more regularly and that helped to uh, depict um, the very real skins of uh, the lobster, shell of the lobster and the skins um, of the, uh, of the uh, lemons and the fruits as well. Still lives with all of this meaning, both from mythological subjects and from biblical subjects, um, that, that sort, of, sort of fit into still lives. It's then interesting that, that all that symbolism tied up in the still life picture from those very different uh, traditions could then also become part of a bigger picture in order to help uh, a contemporary audience understand the narrative of the painting. And for that idea, I turned to the Supper in Mass by Caravaggio, painted at a similar time to the still life we've just seen. Um, but rather than being an Netherlandish artist, Caravaggio uh, was um, a, a, a painter uh, from Italy. Um, Best remembered as an arrogant, rebellious murderer, I think, uh, Caravaggio's paintings really do match the drama of his own life. And we see here this beautiful um, shadow and colouring that um, Caravaggio used, which really made his theatrical paintings um, adored by, by patrons and, and got him fame in his own day. Um, he was born in Lombardy in northern Italy in 1592 and at the age of 21 moved to Rome, which was a, a, a centre for um, artistic uh, creativity uh, at the time. But his first few years was a struggle and he actually specialised in still life painting, quite similar to the ones we've looked at. Um, but his look changed under his meeting of an eminent cardinal, Francesco de Monti, who recognised his talent and took Caravaggio into his household. And it was through this acquaintance that he got his first public commissions which led to his later fame um, and uh, and his celebrity really. Um, in this picture we're looking at uh, a biblical scene um, but you'll notice how sort of close to us it looks whereas when we're looking at the Crivelli pictures we've got these sort of beautiful statuesque monumental figures from the bible who we can only just touch through the placement of an apple at the front of the picture whereas in this painting the people look a lot more real and I think that very dramatic light helps us to engage with the emotion of the story rather than just uh, recognizing the figures through their symbolism as we perhaps did with um, earlier pictures in the Renaissance, a slightly different take on the biblical subject. It depicts the third day after the crucifixion of Christ when two of Jesus' disciples were walking to a mouse and they met the resurrected Christ and didn't recognize him until he took them for dinner and braked 
uh, broke the bread and blessed it and gave it to them. And we see the point in which that realization dawns on these disciples, you know, this great drama of realizing who it is that's breaking the bread. But really what that does uh, in terms of the talk today is put the bread right at the center of this story. Again, that very tactile, very human need to eat something um, uh, at a point where Christ, of course, uh, has been resurrected from the dead. Um, and so the immediacy to, to him as, as someone who can still handle the food stuff, even though he's a divine being, is again, I think, asking the audience to sort of engage on that deep level with their spirituality. Um, so this is a, a picture that just sort of absolutely relies on all of that um, symbolism to convey this uh, sort of order, meeting of the ordinary people with the divine. Another picture from around this time, uh, but this time a Spanish picture by the uh, the master Diego Velázquez, and is is a picture from 1618, just slightly later from the separate a mouse, uh, but a bit earlier than the Dutch still life that we looked at. Um, this uh, picture, as I said, is by Velázquez, who uh, was um, a, a painter who used a form of a genre painting um, set in taverns. And the idea behind this is, again, that uh, immediately to contemporary life of the viewer. And by mixing up scenes of the ordinary with biblical scenes, again, it just provided the audience with that link um, to the biblical stories and the idea that they that Christ could be someone who would walk amongst mankind. So we're looking at two Spanish peasants in a kitchen, probably mi mixing up an aioli, that delicious garlic sauce, as you see the eggs and the garlic in the front of the picture there. You can almost hear her crushing it and smell that beautiful garlic and the fish um, that the maid's uh, preparing. So that's sort of one painting in its own right, this very typical scene of everyday life would have been known to the audience. But as we look through the window, or perhaps to a painting on the wall, it's a bit ambiguous as to which that is. But in the background of the main painting, we get a biblical scene, which is generally accepted to be the story of Martha and Mary um, from the book of Luke 10 verses 38 to 42, where Christ goes to the house of a woman named Martha and her sister Mary sat at his feet and listened to him speak. Martha, on the other hand, went to make all the preparations that had to be made, which, um, upset her sister because she wasn't helping uh, and so she had a little whinge to Christ who responded Martha Martha you are worried and upset about many things but only one thing is needed Mary has chosen what is better and it will not be taken away from her um, and what is better of course is listening to the word of Christ um, so to have that image hanging in front of someone who we might have all otherwise thought was doing noble work of cooking and preparing food um, we can see that having that image next to it suggests that maybe what she should be doing is focusing instead on her religion rather than uh, feeding her own um, uh, sort of very human and very basic desire um, for, for food and for eating, which I think is quite funny, really quite a funny uh, aspect of that picture um, from the artist. So grapes are uh, the next sort of fruit that we'll consider um, slightly, uh, really just an excuse to look at the work of uh, the fabulous Peter Paul Rubens, born in Germany, but by the age of 10, he moved to Antwerp. Uh, and he had a really quite astonishing career. He knew he wanted to be a painter uh, as a youngster and through various apprentices um, under three different artists in Antwerp, grew up to be one of the greatest painters of his day. Uh, he traveled throughout France, Italy and Spain, taking on um, uh, the ideas and the inspiration from the classical uh, and other um, painters that he saw around him, but particularly drawing from sculpture. And we see that in the formation of this uh, artwork, actually quite a sculptural texture to those wonderful bodies um, and, uh, and, and the accessories in it that we see, so a real rigorous control over presenting the three-dimensional in the two dimensions, which I think came from that study uh, of, um, of sculpture. Um, 
Rubens also undertook diplomatic missions um, and uh, eventually moved back to Antwerp, where unfortunately the plague killed his wife, um, which threw him further into his diplomatic missions. And that's how he met Charles I and came to be a court painter at Whitehall. So, like I said, a very interesting um, artist. Uh, but here we're looking at his picture of Bacchus, um, the god of uh, wine and orgies taken from classical mythology. Um, and the, the grapes have that symbolic connection to the blood of Christ, as we've sort of uh, touched upon in the Supper at Emmaus, you know, three days after um, Christ's resurrection. And of course, the, the grapes make up a, a huge part of the Holy Communion uh, in that representation of um, Christ's blood. But really, in painting, the grapes tend to be associated with Bacchus. You always see him um, with uh, the grapes or the vines. Uh, and um, this sort of uh, idea of this picture is, is celebrating that in all of its glory. Uh, the people in this painting, I mean, there's just no two ways of saying it. They are absolutely drunk and debauched and having what appears to be a, you know, absolutely fantastic time without any real care in the world, right down to uh, the small um, sort of cherubic figure in the front, just weeing all over the floor there. So a real uh, heavy one um, for these artists here. So the grapes, in that absolutely signify that this is Bacchus and this is a painting celebrating a good time, a very popular subject um, with, uh, with patrons uh, because it, it, you know, the same as we saw on that floor again, it hints to the idea of, of that sort of, you know, the, the less serious side of life um, that, uh, that celebrating wine um, and, uh, and everything that comes with it as being something um, that uh, was you know, absolutely okay to, uh, to have in your house and to celebrate. So we leave behind old masters now as we come to the end of the talk. And uh, I've just got two uh, modern and contemporary pieces wow. to show you. But um, I just wanted us to think a bit sort of outside painting uh, as well for a while as we think about how artists continue to engage with food and their reasons for using foodstuffs in um, their artwork. So here we have uh, Andy Warhol's iconic Campbell soup cans from 1962. Um, Warhol was an artist who famously used visual elements from consumer culture to create artwork uh, and not just the imagery but the methods by which he produced his artwork were also um, um, consumerist, so he used a silk screen printing, which was originally invented to create um, uh, advertisements uh, for commercial use labels on soup cans, for example, and that sort of thing, as his signature medium. And through sort of using um, that, that method to mass produce his artwork, the same as the soup cans were being mass produced, it really is uh, a comment on um, the sort of the greed and the growing consumerism of society, the fact that even food now is something that can be sort of so mechanized, even though as we've seen in some of the other artists' pictures, it was that immediacy to texture and smell and flavor and eating that um, had actually inspired artists. This is sort of the other way around uh, now. Um, and it's quite interesting why Warhol choose, chose to use the Campbell's soup can in particular, uh, as he, when he replicated that idea of, you know, the stacked supermarket shelf with his individually framed um, replicas of lots of different flavours of soup, uh, but it was only the label title that he actually buried on the front to distinguish the variety. And Warhol's, Warhol said of Campbell's soup, I used to drink it, I used to have the same lunch every day for 20 years, I guess, the same thing over and over again. And I love that, the fact that you, what he's depicting in his artwork was his own visceral experience with the soup of eating the same thing over and over again and that that was possible because of the mechanization of creating the soup, putting it on the shelves and his experience of engaging with that and, um, and of buying it. And um, to sort of bring us not right up to date, but certainly into um, the, the, the end of the 20th century um, with this wonderful picture from an artist I really admire, Sarah Lucas, who uses food a lot in her artwork um, to interact 
with themes of um, mainly of feminism, but of sexuality as well, uh, and of human experience in modernity. So Sarah Lucas was born in the 1960s, uh, around the same time as um, Warhol was making his soup uh, in North London, uh, in Holloway, to a, a milkman father, which is maybe quite indicative um, and interesting when we're considering her artwork, uh, and her mother, who she described as having absolutely no ambition. So after leaving school, she eventually went into Goldsmiths and became uh, part of uh, the group of young British artists in the 1990s. She had a really interesting career where um, she would use found objects and collage to put across her ideas. So one of her very famous pieces is a folded mattress with a very suggestive um, cucumber and bucket sticking up on it, uh, indicative of male and female uh, sex organs. Um, in 1993, she worked with fellow young British artist Tracy Emin to have um, a shop space in East London where they would sell uh, made artworks ranging from T-shirts with slogans and mugs. So again, she's interacting with that idea of uh, commerce, um, but by using uh, the fried eggs in the place of her breasts, um, she really is sort of having a bit of a laugh with it. It's a visual pun and her humour, I think, comes across so much in her artworks to make these sort of quite striking um, pieces. Uh, another piece is a piece of video, which I can't uh, show in this talk for copyright reasons, unfortunately, um, but it's a shutterstock um, for a single frame image of a bowl of fruit, which looks a lot like one of those beautiful, immortalized and preserved baskets of fruit that we saw in the Dutch um, uh, still life painting. And even in pictures like Suzanne's apples, but what she does is just leave it in a room and take one picture, I think every hour, as the fruit decays and uh, becomes moldy and this idea of it becoming stinking. Uh, and it was that, sort of interaction with food and again sort of looking at that as um, portraying the passing of time or the very sort of real human experience that her artwork absolutely speaks to. Um, so I thought that was quite a good uh, place to finish to show that, uh, you know, food in artworks, I think because of that immediacy to our own experience, is still something that's very much used by artists today. Thank you very much for listening and coming along. I have a, a little look at, um, at the questions now. So if you've got any questions, do put those into the chat box and I can answer them. I can see a couple uh, here already, which uh, I'll just read aloud and then answer because I think they've just been sent to me. Uh, so we're interested in more information about William Morris, Jane and Rossetti. Did William Morris go to Iceland because of Rossetti? Why was Jane's marriage to William Morris unhappy? Um, a very good question. The idea that Rossetti and Jane Morris had an affair is quite well hinted at rather than documented. So there's no actual evidence from any letters or diaries that an affair did go ahead. So a lot of this is based on Rossetti spending a lot of time with Jane Morris at Cot Manor and from um, the, the paintings themselves, which of course are very suggestive of that relationship. Um, I would really suggest sort of reading um, biographies on William Morris, such as Fiona McCarthy's fantastic one, to pick up on that a little bit more. It's a little bit beyond the scope of um, this lecture today to, to go into that, um, particularly why Jane's marriage to William Morris was unhappy. From sort of everything that I've ever read and, and picked up on, just to sort of answer that immediately, rather than that be based on any additional research or primary sources, which is I, what I think and truly believe that should be referred to in answering a question like this. Uh, but I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to tell you what's sort of in my head. Um, it was never really a very well-matched marriage. Um, it sort of, uh, so Morris met Jane when he was uh, painting the Oxford mur murals in the debating chamber with other artists such as Edward Byrne-Jones, uh, Dante Gabriel Rossetti, uh, John Rodham Spencer Stanhope um, and Jane was spotted and sort of identified as a stunner by Rossetti um, but within that relationship uh, you know Jane was very working class Morris was middle class and I think he thought he could sort of raise her up uh, and, and teach her give her an education and give her a marriage and to be honest I think that just you know there wasn't sort of a, a, a match 
made in love there um, between them. Um, and another question that, again, I can't really answer within the scope of this, uh, this lecture today is uh, who did Caravaggio murder and why? Caravaggio was known as being um, a bit of a rebel and a drunk, and he was uh, engaged in a brawl outside a pub and so um, uh, pulled a knife on uh, someone he was fighting with and uh, was uh, expelled from Rome. Um, and eventually went back there uh, to when his name had been cleared, but he was on the run for quite some time. And um, so, yeah, a, a drunken mistake as to why he murdered somebody, which is a terrible thing to happen uh, in that artist's life. But he's definitely an artist whose biography is well worth an additional read, such an interesting character. Like taking a, uh, so just a comment, which has been such a wide ranging, fascinating talk, like taking a stroll through a very tasty gallery. Thank you very much, Laura. I'm glad you've enjoyed it. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's fun to do these theme talks, I think, um, rather than sort of just looking at a particular artist or their biography, uh, but to take a theme that's something that can transcend lots of different artworks uh, from, you know, all over the world in different time frames. I think it uh, keeps it lively anyway. Uh, I've had another message about whether the talk's been recorded. Yes, it has. Um, please do bear with me. I hope to have this talk online by Monday or Tuesday next week, and I will post that on our links to the YouTube channel on our social media so that you can catch up. If you have problems with Wi-Fi, I'm sorry to hear that, but yes, it has been recorded. Anyone's got any other questions? Everyone's probably just starving for their lunch now, aren't they, after that? Um, but if there are any other questions, I can hang on. And if not, uh, I'll let you all go for lunch and I'll see you again, um, I think, next week. I think there's a talk next week. I got, maybe not next week. Check our website. I can never remember where the next one is. Um, but thank you so much for coming along today. And um, yeah, go and enjoy your lunch. Thank you, everybody.